Good morning. Okay, let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's well, I'm glad y'all said good morning. How about y'all out there? Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's getting better. All right. Got a few announcements uh, that we want to uh, go over. We will be having praise and worship practice tomorrow night at 6.30, so I want y'all to uh, come out for that. Also, prayer meeting will be at 7.30. Um, on the 27th at 7 o'clock, we're going to be having our ice cream social, and I was told that you need to bring ice cream freezers. Now, when I... when 28th, see, I even wrote it down this time. Okay, the 28th. Now, when they told me ice cream freezers, I was talking to Carrington, I was like, ice cream and ice cream freezers. So for those of you that are like me, we're talking about homemade ice cream. We want you to make it and bring a homemade ice cream and the cones and the syrup and the nuts and the cherry, whatever you want on yours, bring it so everybody else can have some. Okay, also, uh, Hands of Christ is going to be building a ramp. That's uh, September the 6th, 9 a.m. Hey, I got one right. Okay, so Pastor, I know he's probably already been in touch, but if you would love to help somebody that's in need, um, they would appreciate any help that you can give them. Also, um, bingo. Anybody play bingo? All right, one person plays bingo. All right. Well, you win. Um no, our, our annual bingo is going to be coming up, and that's going to be September the 9th, and that's at 1030. So we want you all to, uh, those of you that, that is for our, our seniors bingo. So if you are retired or, you know, you fall into that category, we want you to come out and be a part of that. Also, September the 21st, it's going to be our women's brunch. Now, Kim can answer any questions about women's brunch that you have. There is a sign-up sheet in the back, so they need to get you know, an idea of how many ladies are going to be coming. So uh, so if you will, please sign up for that. And I think that's pretty much the announcements. Anything I missed, Pastor? All right. Pastor's got something he wants to say. I wanted to um, take this opportunity to um, to welcome Pat Zimmerly. She's going to be our music pastor, director, leader. I don't know even know what to write. But anyways, she's, she's going to be it. Amen. Yeah. But, but the thing is, is that I want you to realize that Pat is an ordained minister of the gospel. She's ordained in a four-square church. Um, and I believe she's got some incredible um, skills and gifts to bring to this ministry. So I'm very thankful for her um, joining us. And she's going to make us a better team and a, and a great ministry here. And so I'm so thankful. So please take the time to welcome her, um, show her some love. And um, we're just looking forward to great things. So I just wanted to, uh, to introduce Miss Pat to you this morning. So, and see, I get confused. So I have, because I have another Pat on the second row over there that I get get confused. And so, so she is actually Pat Z to me because her last name is Zimmerly. So she's Pat Z, anyway. So, okay. but that's okay. She's gonna have to take whatever I, I guess whatever I. True. So, so anyways. <laughs> But we're so thankful for it. Let's go ahead and stand and open it with a word of prayer. And then we'll go ahead and um, we'll turn the service over to the music and we'll just go from there. So let's go ahead and open up. Father God, we just thank you in the mighty name of Jesus for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love, God. That you walk with us every step of the way. You are there. You never leave us nor forsake us. God, there's nothing that we face that you've not gone before us. And Lord, we thank you for that today. And so Lord, we pray that you would just inhabit our praises today. That you would just, just fill the church with your spirit today, God, that as we come together today, that we would feel your presence and your power in the house, God, that you touch every need from great to small, Lord, and we just thank you for everything, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise. To our God, every word of worship with 
With one accord, every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Oh 
Still in 
Good morning, Stony Run. Good morning, Stony Run. To God be the glory. It's an honor to stand here in front of all you beautiful faces and just saying good morning and hello. It's a, it's a, it's a blessing that we all are here. And it's another blessing that we all can partake of. At first, I want to turn to Malachi, the third chapter. And I'm going to start at the eighth verse. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But he ye say, say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now wherewith, said the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you, I will open your windows and in heaven and pour out blessings that thy shall have no room to receive it. So that's just to let you know, just by paying your tithes and offerings, it's a blessing to God. It's a blessing to the storehouse. And the blessings that God give back is awesome, y'all. I mean, I love it. And I'm going to continue to pay mine. And at this time, we prepare ourselves to, for the tithes and our offerings. And I'll say a prayer over. Oh, Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning as humble as I know how in Jesus' name. Father, thanking you for all of my brothers and sisters. Father, thanking you for letting me look out over the audience and see them with their beautiful smiles. I thank you for the choir and the anointing that they're singing under this morning, Father. And I thank you for the woman of God that you gave to steer us. Father, I just thank you and I praise you and I worship you. And I pray that you bless those that want to give and those that don't have to give, that the next time maybe they will be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now Jesus was going up on his way to Jerusalem to be lifted high on a tree that he might draw men unto him. Now the multitudes begin to praise him while others were trying to stop him. He said, if they don't praise, the rocks are going to cry out. And there he is, and I am. Oh, to praise the mighty name, the name of the Lord. And there he is, and I am. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Now David was a man of praise, praising God in the sanctuary. He praised him with the trumpet and the horn, and he praised him with the dance. I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm going to praise my Jesus. He said, if I don't praise, the rocks are going to cry out, and there is. And I am, oh, to praise the mighty name, the name of the Lord, and there is, and I am, blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Now David was a man of praise, praising God in the sanctuary, he praised him with the trumpet and the horn. And he praised him with the dance. I don't want to offend anybody, 
but I'm going to praise my Jesus. He said, if I don't praise, those frogs are going to cry out. And there is, and I am. Oh, to praise the mighty name, the name of the Lord. And there is, and I am. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Now I'm telling you, David was a man of praise. Gave God sanctuary. He praised him in the trumpet and the horn. And he praised him with the dance. I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm going to praise my Jesus. He said, if I don't praise, the rocks are going to cry out. And there is, and I am. of the Lord, and there is, and I am, blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of kings, blessed is the Lord of lords, he is my Jesus, I'm gonna praise his name, who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are we ready to praise the Lord today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm excited. Excited about what God's doing and what He's doing in our lives. Uh, Today I want to talk about something a little bit. I want to talk about what it means to be blessed in the kingdom of God. Everybody talks about being blessed. We all want blessing. We want to be blessed. I want to bless this, bless that, bless everything. What's it mean to be blessed in the kingdom of God? And I want, I, want to, I want to break this down a little bit because I think that sometimes we confuse what blessing really is. And so I want us to go ahead and get, to, get into what blessing really is. I want to go ahead and read from the Beatitudes today. So if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, we'll go ahead and start there in the Word of God. Everything should start in the Word of God. When you preach a sermon, the first thing you should do is find your passage or your scripture and preach from that passage. Preach your sermon from the Word of God. People don't need, they don't care what you say. They don't care what you think. What they care about is what the Word of God says. you got to base everything in the Word, and if you'll base everything in the Word, then you won't go astray. So we're going to go ahead and start out in the Word of God today. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who, they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Father God, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus for your word today. God, we pray, Lord, that your word will do exactly what it was called to do. Lord, that it will touch our hearts, it will touch our minds, it will change our minds, it will transform our minds, our thinking, God. That your Holy Spirit will be released in the house today. Lord, that you would make us more than we could ever be. Because, God, without you we are nothing, but with you anything is possible. And so, God, today we just pray, God, that you would touch and move in your word. Touch the people today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
All right, so I want to talk about blessing. Well, see, part of this thing is that there's a lot of different translations of the Bible nowadays. You know, we can get any kind of translation you want. You can get a modern translation. You get a King James translation. A lot of people like King James because, you know, Jesus spoke in King James English while he was here on the earth. That was a joke. Okay, anyways. No, he did not speak King King James English. But anyways, um, Unless it was Aramaic, King James English. I don't know. But anyways, um, so, so the thing is, is you can get the translation any way you want. A lot of translations say happy instead of blessed in the Beatitudes. And I take, I, I don't like that. Because see, what we consider happiness is not what God considers blessing. See, happiness is based on your circumstances. The blessing of God is based on God. Amen. And so, so I want you to understand that. So we're going to have a little Greek lesson for a second here. I figured, you know, it was all Greek to me until I studied on it, and now I understand it. But, but anyways, there is a Greek word for blessed, and it's makarios, okay? And, and makarios used by the Greeks, and I'm going to give you a little, little lesson here, and what the Greeks thought of the word makarios. When they spoke of makarios, first thing that when they said something was blessed in this way, they spoke of their Greek gods, that the Greek gods were absolutely blessed. I mean, I want you to think about that. If you're a God, obviously everything's going your way, right? Everything, you're obviously blessed. The second group of people that they talked about with this Makarios was the dead. That when you've left this world that you're no longer fighting this battle anymore. You're no longer fighting this old earth and you've gone on to something better. So they used it for their gods, for the dead, and also in the last category, for the filthy rich. I know a lot of people in the world today would love to be filthy rich. Okay, that's the way the Greeks used that word. They used makarios for their gods, for the dead, for the filthy rich. But, but I want you to understand something. Makarios, it, it, when, when we say blessed in here, blessed are the poor in spirit, or blessed are they who mourn, makarios defines a condition that already exists. Okay, it's not something that's fixing to take place. It's not something that's coming in a week or two. Makarios means something that already exists. Something that's true about someone, not something someone says about someone so see I want you to understand something when God calls you blessed you are blessed it doesn't matter what anybody says to you you can't they can't take the blessing of God away from you it's a reality it's an inward state of truth no matter how we actually feel so many people base their life on their feelings God throw the feelings away you will never walk in the blessedness of God if you base your stuff on feelings the heart is deceitful and wicked and who can understand it it's going to turn you astray follow the word of God God says that that if you're blessed, it's an inward reality. It's a state of truth, no matter how we actually feel. God is making a proclamation about our situation. When Jesus says blessed, he's acknowledging something that we already possess. All right, see, you got to understand that. See, there's power in the word of God. Blessed is a state of existence in a relationship to God in which a person is blessed from God's perspective. From God's perspective, not from man's perspective, not from what we see, but from what God sees. Even when you don't feel happy or you're not presently experiencing good fortune. Because see, a lot of folks, they base base their whole life, oh, obviously I'm not blessed because I have too many bills. Or I'm not blessed because I'm sick. Or I'm not blessed because this, because of that, because of whatever it is. That has nothing to do with blessedness that God is talking about in the Word of God. Blessed is something from God's perspective. Now, Jesus is going to give you eight situations in the Sermon on the Mount in which he calls people blessed. And see, here's the thing. All these situations, most of them are not what we would consider to be blessed. Okay? Because and, and think about this. He, he says that those who are poor in spirit are blessed. Well, a lot of people would say, well, no, they're depressed, not blessed, right? Oh, you're poor in spirit. You're depressed, not blessed, right? Okay, what about those that are mourning? Oh, you can't possibly be, be blessed in the midst of your mourning. You know, um, you can't, you can't bl- be blessed when you're, when you're meek or when you're hungering for righteousness or when you're merciful or when you're pure in heart or you're a peacemaker or especially when you're persecuted. Anytime we th- feel ourselves persecuted, we don't think that we're blessed. We think the blessing of God is shut off and there's no longer any blessing there. But I'm here to tell you that blessing of God is based upon God. It states a relationship that already exists in which a person is blessed from God's perspective. Doesn't matter whether you feel happy. Doesn't matter whether you're experiencing it right now. Doesn't matter any of that. So many people, they're so worried about feelings. They're so worried about emotion. Get all that out of the way and start listening to what the Word of God says. If He says you're blessed, then guess what? You're blessed whether you like it or not. 
Some people sit and say, I dare you to bless me, Lord. The source of the blessing is God. Well, let's, let's start out here because I want you to look at something. I'm only going to look at like four of these um, Beatitudes. But I, I want you to understand that there's a progression here. There's a process here. There's, there's, a, there's a, a pathway to blessing here. There's, there, this is how you get there. This is how, how you become blessed in the sense to where you actually recognize and feel the blessing of God in your life. The first one in verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, or blessed. Which, which do you guys like, blessed or blessed? See, sometimes you want to be real, you know, blessed. Anyways. Or we can be blessed, either way. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. But what is poor in spirit? See, a lot of people say, well, they're de- depressed, or they're, they're down, or they're out, or whatever. You're poor in spirit. What, what, what is this? But see, I, I want to get you somewhere where you got to get. If you're ever going to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, anybody here want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Amen? Amen. We want a relationship, right? Well, the only way you can have a relationship with Christ is that you've got to get to this place called spiritual bankruptcy. Okay, you got to go completely broke. You got to go and get to the place where, where you, you got nowhere to look but to God. Amen. See, a lot of times God takes you down and He will humble you and knock you flat on the ground, take the breath right out of your lungs to where the only thing you can do is look up. And when you get to that point, that's called spiritual bankruptcy. That's called being poor in spirit. That's where salvation comes from realizing you can't save yourself. The best thing we like in the United States is self-help. Oh, just give me a book so I can read about it and I'll fix myself. You can't fix yourself. You can't do it. The only one that can fix you is Jesus Christ. But you got to get bankrupt enough. you got to get humble enough. you got to get that pride out of the way, realizing you can't save yourself. You're a sinner. You're hopelessly lost. And no amount of self-improvement will cleanse you from your sins or forgive you or grant you divine forgiveness. No matter what, that doesn't come from man. Hallelujah. That comes from Almighty God. And when He calls you blessed in that state, that's from God. That's not from man. So you got to understand that. you got to know that. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Isaiah was in the throne room of God. And he gets in there and it states, And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I'm undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, I'm here to tell you, I want to ask you today, do you remember when you were undone before God? Do you remember when you were undone? I remember when I was undone before God. I cried like a baby. I just blubbered, man. I had, I had just, oh, man, I was undone. I finally realized I was undone. I finally realized that everything that I thought was a success was a failure. Everything that I had placed my hope in, my trust in, it was sinking sand. There was only one that could save me, and his name was Jesus. And, I, and then when I finally realized that, hallelujah, I said, you know what? I don't know what it is, but I was like a drowning man fixing to go down, and God threw me a life preserver and says, son, if you'll grab a hold of this I'll save your soul and change your life and that's when you get spiritually poor that's when you're undone do you remember that when you're undone see a lot of folks think they're so good they don't need Jesus they just come to church to make us all happy I'm here to tell you you got to get to the point where you allow God the word of God tells us that his strength is perfected through our weakness When we're weak, he's strong. Look, I'd rather have Jesus strong and me weak. Amen? (laughs) Because all things are possible through him. That's that's where I want to be. R. Kent Hughes says this. He says, the first link between my soul and Christ is not my goodness, but my badness. Not my merit, but my misery. Not my standing, but my falling. See, you got to understand who you are. you got to understand that, that each one of us, we've got to get to that point to where, where we reach out to Jesus Christ as our only hope, y'all. Our only, that's your only hope. If you want to make it, the only hope you've got is Jesus Christ. you got to get to the point where you realize, quit trying to fix yourself and allow God to supernaturally fix you. Then you'll see something different. But as long as you keep trying to fix yourself, as long as you sit on the throne of your life, as long as you're prideful and you're going to do it all yourself, God won't do anything. He'll just say, well, fine, fix yourself then. You're so good at this, fix yourself. 
God said, you take the hands off the wheel, I'll take you where you need to go. But you got to let me drive. The second one, so the poor in spirit. So we got, in order for blessing to take place, in order to be blessed in the, the eyes of God, for that blessing to reside upon you, you got to get poor. And if you can get poor, then the kingdom of heaven is yours. That, that things will be opened up in your life. I mean, things are going to be different. Something different's going to happen. And, and, and I can't wait. See, I'm here to tell you, God can do anything, anytime, anyhow He wants, y'all. You don't understand. He can take you from, from wherever you are to wherever He needs to get you to. But you got to let him. you got to let him. So many people kicking and screaming. Bless me if you can, Lord. I mean, they won't, they won't allow God to move. They won't allow God to touch. They won't allow God to do those things. Well, here's the thing. When you get poor in spirit, when you start realizing that you are spiritually bankrupt, you know what that kind of does to you? It's kind of depressing. I mean, we just sung a really awesome, upbeat song. And I was like, yeah, it was awesome, Pat. You know, the rocks are going to cry out. But I'm here to tell you that the only one that was crying out when, when I got to that point in my life was me. And I was like, I'm wrecked. I'm broken. Lord, what do I do now? You're right. I'm, I'm a mess, man. I'm a soup sandwich. I don't know what to do. And, and I was like, Lord, please don't leave me in this state. Well, here's the thing. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Oh, man, Jeremiah 17, 14 states this. It says, heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. I'm telling you, man, when you get to that point where, where we're not mourning over the trials and tribulation of life. Look, trial and tribulation, it's common to every one of us. Every one of you got bills. I know you do. If you don't have any bills, well, then praise God, you are more blessed than I am today. But if most of us have bills, and sometimes we can't pay the bills, and sometimes we're shuffling money around here and there and trying robbing Peter to pay Paul and then Paul gets really up, he gets excited but Peter gets really mad at us and all these things are going on we're, we're not mourning over the trials and tribulations of life we're mourning over the sin in our lives we don't like to talk about sin anymore because all of us are too sanctified to do that. However, sin creeps in. It lays like a dog at the side of the door and every time you walk out of the house there he is just waiting Mourning over the sin in our lives. The need for true repentance is great in the Christian church. There's been too much love preached and not enough repentance. There's been too much of, oh, well, God will forgive you. You don't have to change. I'm here to tell you, you've got to change. Because if the Lord Jesus Christ comes and lives in your heart, you will change. We need repentance. Repentance is not enough to admit your sin. Repentance is not enough to ask for forgiveness. Repentance is changing the way you're going. Turn around. Flee from the sin. Change your life. Do something different. We can't be like the old hog and just return right back to the mire. We can't be like the old dog and return back to the vomit. We can't be that way. If we're really repenting, if we're really mourning over the sin in our lives, then we change our situation. We change our behavior. 1 John 1, 9 and 10 states this. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm here to tell you right now in the name of Jesus, if you got something that's besetting you today, if you got something that you just can't seem to get over, if you'll confess your sins to God, He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And I'll add this on. If we say that we've not sinned, we make Him a liar. And His Word is not in us because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's times where we all fall short. There's times where we all fall down. But God will cleanse us. He will forgive us. The benefits of mourning over sin? Forgiveness. I'm here to tell you, forgiveness comes from God and nowhere else. That's the only place you can truly find forgiveness in your spirit and in your soul comfort from the Holy Spirit that comes to where God actually comes in and comforts us he's the paraclete he's the comforter he's the one that comes in and comforts our spirit in our mourning in the midst of that and we become restored as a child of God man I want you to think about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 verses 18 through 20 it states this it says I will set out and go back to my father and say to him Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. 
I mean, I want you to understand that. That's, that's, that's repentance. That's, that's figuring out where you're at. That's figuring out who God is. That's figuring out where I need to be. My God has created me for much more than what I'm living right now. I might be living in a hog pen, but hallelujah, he wants me to come home. But I've got to admit to him. I've got to tell him, look, I want to come back, Father. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm not even worthy to be called your son, but just make me a hired man. Just let me come home. So he gets up. And he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. That's the comfort that they're speaking of. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Hallelujah. If you'll repent from your sin and run back to Jesus, he will catch you. He'll run down the road to you. He'll throw his arms around you. He'll kiss you. He'll bless you. He will comfort you. But you got to mourn over it. you got to realize the hog pen's not doing it for you anymore. you got to get on out of that lifestyle and get on into what God has for you. And see, so many times we, we don't preach it like it should be preached. We don't tell people like we should be telling them. Sin is the enemy, y'all. That's the enemy. That's what's tearing this world apart. It always has been. Since the Garden of Eden, when sin slipped in, man was cursed because of sin and disobedience. That's it. We got to understand what the enemy, who the enemy really is. We got to figure that out. Verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Man, that's like kind of a, one of those you scratch your head, right? Usually most people say meekness equals weakness, right? Isn't that what we say? Oh, that person's real meek and mild over there. I can do anything I want to. They ain't saying nothing because they're meek and mild. But meekness is not weakness. Man, I want you to understand that. Don't equate meekness with weakness. Psalm 37, verses 7 and 8 state this. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. So see, that's your first step to, in order to attaining meekness, in order to attain that in God, is you got to understand that you can rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. You should be able to rest in God. You should be able, no matter what the situation, no matter the storm around you, you should be able to sit on down in the Lord and rest in Him, waiting patiently for what God is going to do, because God is going to do something. It says, do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Man, I want you to understand, we get, we get angry over stuff. This is not on here, but let me, let me get, get a little real with you. Y'all ever go to Walmart on Saturdays? That's the mission field, y'all. I'm here to tell you. Most of them people got the sticker on the back of their car, you know, see me in church on Sunday right about time they about to run you over for that parking spot. And, you know, yeah, I'll see you all right. Hallelujah. From up above in the cloud of witnesses, you know, you just about run me over. But I see people get so upset, so mad. Yesterday we're in the parking lot. Me and Gina walking out with a cart full of groceries. And, um, and as we're walking out, well, this lady about backs over us. <laughs> You know, because she's trying to get out of her spot. And, and so we're kind of, you know, getting over here. And then there's a lady in a white car here that's, that's sitting, waiting on this parking spot that the lady just about run us over to get in there. And then there's a big old pickup truck behind this lady, and he's right up on the edge of her, blowing his horn and everything, like she can go somewhere, okay? All right, unless that thing's like kit car or something, can hop over that vehicle, you ain't going nowhere, brother. I'm just telling you, you got to stay there. And so, so he's all this way and that way trying to get. And finally, the, the lady up here, she gets out and gets out of there. And the other lady, she finally pulls in a spot. And then what's he do? All right, man, where is he going? Where is he going? Where are you going? Over a parking spot, y'all. Everybody wants peace. Everybody wants all these things. And they act like a pure fool in the Walmart parking lot. They get all out of sorts because somebody has inconvenienced you. Well, I'm here to tell you that maybe what you needed to do was leave an hour earlier and you wouldn't even have to worry about that car. I'm just saying. 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Oh, the other part of that story was, is that my wife told me that we needed to wave at them when they came by. Some of you will understand that because they had some meme up on Facebook that, you know, when people are ugly and mean, I just wave at them. I said, honey, I think we should have waved when he come by, but he probably would have took my arm off of the mirror because he come through so fast. But, whoo, wow, man, now you know that really pumps up your... And I was looking to see what the sticker was on the back. It wasn't Stony Run, but I'm just saying. Anyways, I was, I was like, man, I've not seen him at service in a while, but maybe that's good. No, it wasn't. It wasn't anybody from Stony Run. Maybe Long Branch. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Long Branch. No. Um, here's the thing about meekness. Meekness is having complete trust in the sovereignty of God. Okay, you trust who God is. God spoke this universe into existence. He's got your life. He's got your problem. He's got a plan. He's working it all out. Jesus was our example of meekness. In 1 Peter 2, 20 through 23, it states this. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. There's times where you're going to do good in this world and you're going to suffer for doing good. People are going to persecute you. People are going to blow horns at you because you're allowing somebody else to back out. You're not running people over in the parking lot. You're not doing these things. You know? You're going to suffer because of that. And, and here, here's what he says. He says, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was the seat found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. The hardest thing it is to do in this whole world is when you're reviled to not revile right on back. You know, I mean, we, we, you know, we, we're ready. Look, we all about Jesus here on Sunday morning. But if I go out this door and somebody cuts me off on 55, I'm going to let them know what they th- I think about them. We've got to learn how to not revile. We've got to learn how to, how to walk in, in patience and, and not have deceit found in our mouths and not threaten people and, and commit our lives to God. But, you know, how can we be meek? I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. Is, is, is it's difficult. But God has declared us blessed. If he says you're blessed, nobody can take that from you. Nobody can take that from you. See, I want you to understand, nobody can take the blessing from you. If God has blessed you, they can't take it. They can't get it away from you. Joseph, when he was, when he was sold into slavery, right? And when he was sold to slavery, right? And then he goes to Potiphar's house. He's, he's accused of trying to rape his wife. He gets thrown into prison. All these things happen to him. God's favor was upon his life, and nobody could take the blessing from him. God had the blessing on him. Everywhere he landed, he landed on his feet. Everywhere he went, he had the blessing of God. That's because God declared Joseph blessed. When he declares you blessed, it's already a done deal. Our circumstances in life will not affect our status in God's eyes. We are blessed. Y'all, you got to understand that in the church. we got to realize who we are. We call ourselves blessed. We are blessed. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. We'll go ahead and go to the, the fourth one I want to talk about. Verse 6 tells us this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Wow. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Can I tell you something today, y'all? We are what we eat. Literally. <laughs> we are what we eat. What we put in determines what comes out. There was an old song I used to play for my youth group back in the day. It was called Garbage In, Garbage Out. What you put in is what you'll get out. If you feed on violence, you feed on excitement, erotica, materialism, you're eventually, that's what you're going to look like. You're going to look violent, you're going to look erotic. You're going to look materialistic. You're going to look excited. You're going to, you're going to be what you eat. You know what, what, what you watch on TV? It affects you. And I'm going to go one step further. The commercials in between the shows are even worse than the shows sometimes. Amen? 
I mean, it's telling our little girls to live a certain way, very, very promiscuous, very, very, you know, and that's wrong. We shouldn't raise our children up to be like that. We, there's all these things. Everything's being sold by sex and by different things on the TV. And I'm not saying that you throw your TV out and get rid of it. I'm just saying what you watch on TV affects you. The music you listen to affects you. Every bit of it. Look, I mean, I'm here to tell you, you know, if you're listening to, to songs like Knocking Boots, I know y'all know that song. What's his name? He was on um, American Idol. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you, well, y'all might not like it, but your kids do because it's on their playlist along with other things. And I said, y'all know what knocking boots means? And they all just kind of look. Your music affects you. The people you surround yourself with affect you. You surround yourself with negativity. Guess what you're going to be? Negative. You are going to be negative to the nth degree, and you'll probably take it even more extreme than the negative one that's beside you, just so you can go ahead and set an example for them. Look, I can show you negativity. You want to see negative? Let me show you negative. I mean, if you're around positive people, you tend to be more positive. Everything that you surround yourself with affects you. If you're around people that love the Lord, then you're going to love the Lord more. If you surround yourself with people that don't love the Lord, then be careful because you may very well start to resemble them. And you may start talking like them. And you may start doing that. And I'm not saying not to talk to people about Jesus. I'm not saying not to hang out with people in the world. We have to. What I'm saying is your closest friends should be Christians. They should be Christians. You should be surrounding yourself with people that you know are going to build you up, not tear you down. you got to know that. you got to surround yourself with the right people. Psalm 63, 1 verses 8 speaks of the hunger and thirst for the things of God. See, that's, that's what we talk about. You know, why is it we don't hunger and thirst about the things of God? Why, why don't we hunger after Him? It says, oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I've looked to you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I met, remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. Why is it that we hunger and thirst for the things in the world and not the things of God. Why is it that we don't get excited about church and get excited about the things that God are doing, but we'll get excited about a brand new 2019 GMC Denali pickup truck? Why is it that we'll take every piece of money we got and tuck it away to be able to go on a cruise somewhere? And, and we, 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 we leave all these things out and we don't treat God with the same respect we do. Why is it that we're willing to work 60 and 70 hours a week to make money, but we won't come to church three hours a week? Why is it that we do those things? Why don't we hunger and thirst for the things of God like we do for the things of the world? See, I used to be the band leader. You talk about somebody who would lead you into sin, I was first in line. I was the one that was going to be there. I was going to be the loudest, the most raunchiest, the most rude, the most crude, the most everything it was. I chased the devil as hard as I could with everything I had, with every waking moment. I was trying to please the devil because that's who I served. And I'm here to tell you, when I got saved, I switched my affiliation. Hallelujah. And I started chasing God as hard as I chased the devil. Wouldn't it be nice if we started chasing God like we chased the devil? The tragedy of our time is that the world is hungering and thirsting after sex and wealth and violence and excitement. And the church's tragedy is that many in her are seeking the same thing. You know, the incidence of divorce is just as high in the church as it is in the world. The instance of all these sins is just as high in the church as it is in the world. Why is God not making a difference in our churches? Their diets 
are making them as empty and pathetic as the world. And see, here's the thing, you know. You can tell people, you need, to, you need to get saved. We can get out there and we can witness all we want. But I'm here to tell you that there is a witness that you do that doesn't include your mouth. It includes your actions. What do you approve by your lifestyle? What do you approve by, by how you live? What do you approve by what you watch? What do you approve? Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to get on the clothesline or anything. I'm not getting there. But what I'm saying is, is there's a certain way that you need to be in this world. Young ladies, I'm here to tell you, if you dress like a harlot, you will be treated like a harlot. You say, I can't believe they, you will be treated like what you put, if you're putting bait out, look, even a mouse is ready to go get some cheese. You say, all oh, those men shouldn't be like that. No, young ladies, <laughs> young ladies, be careful how you dress, because you're putting signal out. Young men, we shouldn't have to tell the girls how to dress because you should be living the upright, godly life that God has called you to. If it was up to men, and I think a man has to be involved somehow, if men were righteous and men walked and served the Lord and followed God hard, then we wouldn't have to worry about, about uh, abortion anymore because there wouldn't be any more unwanted pregnancies because young men would say, no, I'm not going there. God told me to be holy, to set myself aside. Hallelujah, and I don't care. You wouldn't even have to worry about what the girls are doing if the guys would just take their part and get in front of the line and say I'm not doing that everybody always tries to put it on the ladies I'm putting it on the men a man was a stronger vessel let's let men be who men are supposed to be we should be the the paragon of righteousness we should be the priest in our home we should be the priest in our family we should be the priest where we're at let's start being who we need to be whatever you entertain people think you approve so remember that Whatever you entertain, people are going to think that you approve that. If you listen to songs or listen to different things or whatever it is, and they hear it coming from you, then automatically you're saying, I approve that. I approve that. This message was approved by me. I approve that. Church, we got to be different. If you want to be the blessed of God, then start living like the blessed of God. I want to ask you this. Are you yearning for the blessing of God today? Are you really hungry for His? Are you hungry and thirsting for, for the blessing of God? I mean, I mean, when they talk about a deer panning for the water, they talk about, about thirst. I don't know about y'all. Y'all ever worked a hot day in a tobacco field or, or on a framing crew or somewhere it might be where it was so hot and they put that cooler all the way at the end of the row and you knew if you could just get to the end of the row, you'd get you a cold drink. You remember those days? Some of you may, some of you may not. I'm here to tell you, when you got there, that water was awesome. You were hungering. You were thirsting and you were panting for that water that water at the end of the road because you knew that would quench your thirst I'm talking about a water that will quench every thirst I'm talking about a water that you'll never thirst again I'm talking about the water of Jesus Christ the power of the Holy Ghost I'm talking about a yearning but the path to blessing starts with spiritual bankruptcy we got to realize that, look, we can't do this on our own. If you think you're going to change yourself, you're sorely mistaken. You can't change yourself. There is one. His name is Jesus. He will change you. If you'll allow him, he will change you, but you got to let him. you got to realize you're spiritually bankrupt. you got to realize you need Jesus. you got to mourn over your sin, not because you got caught, because it's displeasing to God. When was the last time you mourned over a sin because it was displeasing to God? Not because you got caught. See, a lot of people, they just don't. They say, well, I, should, I won't never do that again. Why won't you do that again? Well, I got a ticket. Or I got this or I got that. What about God? You know, he sees all this stuff. And when we sin, in essence, I don't care if I walk up to Brother James and I slap him across the face. I've not sinned against James. I've sinned against God. See, that's, that's how this works. I mean, I, I know you, sometimes you say, oh, no, he sinned against him. No, 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 you don't understand. I sinned against God. Any sin that I, I, I do, I sin against God. We got, we got to understand that. We got to know that in the church today. The path to blessing starts with spiritual bankruptcy. It starts with mourning over our sin. It starts turning from our sin and changing the way you live. If you tell somebody you're sorry, and you keep right on doing the very same thing over and over and over and over again, you know what you are? A liar. You're a liar. 
Because if you keep right on and on and on doing what you said you were sorry for and you keep doing it, then what you are is a liar. You're not sorry at all. Because if you were sorry, true repentance means turning from what you were doing and changing the way that you live. we got to realize the Holy Spirit gives us the power to overcome sin and temptation. I'm here to tell you today, you're not powerless unless you want to be. It's up to you to appropriate what the Lord Jesus Christ has given us. He's given us a tutor. He's given us one to walk with us. His name is the Holy Spirit. We've got to become meek. Trust in the sovereignty of God. He has us. And nothing in this world can revoke the blessing upon our lives. But his blessing's not based on our circumstances. If he says we're blessed, then nothing can change that. But we've got to hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God, not the things of this world. We've got to feed on what matters, what pleases God, not what pleases man or pleases the flesh. That's what we've got to seek and desire. Would you all please stand as we dismiss this morning? I know some of you are saying, boy, you're kind of rough on us today, Rick. I'm not being rough. What I'm trying to explain is, is there's a God in heaven And he sees every single thing that we do. Not only is there a God in heaven, but there's people around us watching us. You may be that Christian friend that someone has. And they're looking at your walk to see how you act, to see what you do. Are you different from them? Or do you live the same as they do? If you call yourself a Christian, then you should be different. So as we close today. I want you to understand that your blessing from God does not depend upon your circumstances. You know, some of you right now, you may be in a spot where you're like, man, God must really be mad at me because my whole world is upside down. Everything's sideways. I don't know what to do. I'm here to tell you, your blessing does not depend upon your circumstances. You are blessed because God said you are blessed. So as we close today, I want to invite you If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, make today that day that you can walk into the blessing. Because, see, the first thing you've got to realize is you are spiritually bankrupt. You can't save yourself. You can't do it. You can't save yourself. Only Jesus Christ can save you. So I invite you today, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, why, come on down. Surrender. I can't make you do that. This is from God. If God's calling you right now, then the best thing you can do right now, if he's on your heart, on your mind, if you're under conviction right now, you need to run down to this altar. You may not have another day of visitation. You don't know what you're going to have. And if you're under conviction right now, you need to run down to this altar. Don't walk. Run. Get on down here and get on in. Because I'm here to tell you, your whole life could just change and you won't even realize the power in God. For those of you here today that you just, man, you're struggling. You're like, Lord, I'm I'm struggling. I feel, you tell me I'm blessed. Oh, Lord, how much more humble can I be? How much more contrite? Lord, I need you. I need physical healing. I need a touch, God. If that's you today, then I tell you to look to the one who has blessed you. Look to the one who has called you blessed. In the midst of your circumstances, he is there walking with you. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father God, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love, God. Lord, I I pray for that one right now that's listening to this message and their heart is is being rent right now by the Holy Spirit that they don't know. They know that something's going on, that something's happening, that something's different. And God, they're fighting it right now because they're scared to death to step out of the world and into your blessing, God. And Lord, I pray, God, for that one that's struggling right now, Lord. Lord, that they would release and allow you to save their soul. God, that they would just realize that they are spiritually bankrupt and there's nothing they can do. And that all forgiveness, all love, all blessing comes from you, from your divine hand. Lord, for those of us here today, God, 
Lord, that our circumstances just seem crazy and we don't understand all these things. Lord, I pray that we would open up the Word of God and not base our blessing upon our feelings, but base our blessing upon Your Word that You say we're blessed and that can't be changed by anything that's done here on earth. That's in Your hand. And God, we're just going to thank You for everything. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.